I give you a new commandment. Once more, a very warm welcome to you. Again, particularly for folks at home, this is the 20th of June, 2021, the fourth week of Trinity and Father's Day. And we gather together in our worship this morning with words from the Great Commission. And uh, Alan uh, will read us, uh, will lead us in that uh, uh, consideration. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Thank you, Alan. We, uh, we listen to, rather than sing at this time, but we listen to hymn 22, The Lord's My Light.
the prayer with words from Psalm 78. The opening words have this to say. Listen, my people, to my teaching and pay attention to what I say. I'm going to use wise sayings and explain mysteries from the past. We have heard and known things that our ancestors told us. We will not keep them from our children. We will tell the next generation about the Lord's power and his great deeds and the wonderful things he has done. With these words in mind, let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts to you and pray. We give you thanks for all that you have done, thanking you for being our refuge and our strength, thanking you for your great deeds and the wonderful things that you have done. Thank you for your goodness in our lives. When we wake each morning, we have cause to praise your name. So we give thanks that no matter what the circumstances, we can count on you to shelter us and to give us strength. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are poor in spirit and confess to you all our sins and iniquities, those known and unknown. We're not perfect and we fall short every day of our lives. Thank you for your mercy. This day we are reminded of the role that each of us bears to make the world a better place, better for generations to come, that they might enjoy lives even better than those which we ourselves have enjoyed. And in that sense, whether we have children of our, of our own or not, we are fathers and mothers to a generation. So when we think of fathers this Father's Day, help us to see that none are excluded in our thoughts or our prayers or our duties. Regardless of our gender, we have a part to play in both caring and protecting those around us, both in our immediate community and beyond. May we all be fathers of the faith. Gracious and merciful God, we gather in one heart and mind to pray for all families and individuals, but particularly those who've left and fled their country, their land, their homes, seeking safer and better lives. We lift up to you their hopes and their dreams, their fears and their anxieties, and all their needs and necessities, that they may be protected on their journeys, and that their dignity and their rights might be fostered and honoured and upheld, and that they might find a welcome, open arms into communities that prove both generous and compassionate. We pray for those refugees finding a new life here in Scotland, we pray that both they and their families will, will settle here. We pray for the children who've had to start new schools and make new friends. Even as we also pray for the adults learning a new language and a new culture. We pray especially this Father's Day for fathers who in their own lands were the breadwinners with a sense of pride in their role in life who may feel emasculated by their change in circumstances and yet give thanks for the safety of their families. We pray for those helping them to find their feet in their new lives. Lord, bless all refugees and those displaced persons everywhere and bring an end to the strife in our world which sees so many people driven from their homes and the friends and the family that they love. God of family, 
We bring before you the parents who are weeping and lamenting, who are waiting for their children of whom there is no trace due to loss or separation at sea or in the desert or on railway tracks, in shipping containers and all the uncertainties that these journeys have brought. God of life, we bring before you our lament for the dead, those stranded at the borders of safety who died in their flight through deserts over mountains and seas. And we call to you to join in the cry of all who sought justice and a better life for themselves and their children and yet perished in the process. God of justice, we bring before you political leaders and their advisors and the various decision makers who hold the fate of others in their hands. Make them aware of the causes of migration and flight. Keep their consciences alive so that refugees again are offered protection and dignity. Give to all fathers an awareness of others and a sense of solidarity in all that each other experience. And finally, we are reminded, Heavenly Father, of the simple words that encompass so much in prayer that we might direct to you, since they were given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to say together, even as we may this morning, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, our lesson this morning is going to be led by Carol McCruden. We're going to listen to the 27th Psalm, Psalm 27, there are 14 verses in all. I invite uh, Carol to lead us in that lesson. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I will fear no one. The Lord protects me from all danger. I will never be afraid. When evil people ta attack me and try to kill me, they stumble and fall. Even if a whole army surrounds me, I will not be afraid. Even if enemies attack me, I will trust God. I have asked the Lord for one thing. One thing only do I want to live in the Lord's house all my life, to marvel there at his goodness and to ask for his guidance. In times of trouble, he will shelter me. He will keep me safe in his temple and make me secure on a high rock. So I will triumph over my enemies around me. With shouts of joy, I will offer sacrifices in his temple. I will sing, I will praise the Lord. Hear me, Lord, when I call to you. Be merciful and answer me. When you say, come worship me, I answered, I will come, Lord. Don't hide yourself from me. Don't be angry with me. Don't turn your servant away. You have been my help. Don't leave me. Don't abandon me. O oh God, my saviour. My father and mother may abandon me, but the Lord will take care of me. Teach me. Lord, what you want me to do, and lead me along a safe path, because I have many enemies. Don't abandon me to my enemies, who attack me with lies and threats. I know that I will live to see the Lord's goodness in this present life. Trust in the Lord. Have faith. Do not despair. Trust in the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless the, that reading of his holy and inspired word. 
and to him be the praise. Amen. And thank you, Carol. As we meditate upon that passage, we also listen to a, a recording of our choir singing the anthem Across the Lands. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, before I begin in earnest, I want to offer an apology. For those who hate football, the beautiful game, and even for those who love it, I'm going to probably going to make a bit of a mincemeat of it, uh, but I'm going to use the football as an illustration. I'm not a huge football fan myself, I have to be honest with you. I'll, I'll watch it occasionally, not least actually probably because I got put off it a wee bit because my granddad died when I was a teenager after the, uh, the Scotland-Wales match, the same night that Jock Steen died. You'll know the one in 1985. Um, we did at least qualify for the World Cup as a consequence. But uh, this year, of course, we're thinking about the UEFA Cup, which has been in the news so much. 
And I have to say, as I was looking at the, um, the crowds there, they weren't so well physically distanced as we are this morning. So it's lovely to see that people are taking things seriously when it comes to looking after our own health and care. But after starting badly against the Czech Republic on Monday, on Friday we finally managed a draw against England. After playing some great football, for those who know their football, I'm sure you enjoyed the match as I did myself, both on both sides, it was really good football. I have to say we've got our work to cut out with us now uh, to make our particular group, but at least apparently we can boogie. <laughs> I'm not quite sure yet what that means, but apparently we can boogie. Yesterday, Germany had an incredible win, 4-2 against Portugal. And that's my son's favorite side, Portugal, because of Ronaldo. He absolutely loves him. Uh, but tonight, Wales play Italy. And both look certain of going through to the next round. And it's Wales and Italy that I'm particularly interested in this morning for reasons that will uh, become hopefully fairly clear. Tonight they play a game where virtually regardless of the result because of their previous games, they're gonna, it's going to see them winning through to the next round. How do you think they're going to play? Do you think the players will just sit down on the pitch, fold their arms and just let the time disappear and trickle through their fingers? Do you think they'll take it easy? Or do you think they might like to try and entertain the fans? Well, I certainly hope so. Knowing the outcome of different situations that we face in life is incredibly rare. But when something does seem to be a foregone conclusion, do we just coast our way along to either success or failure, depending on which it is that we think is going to be the outcome? Or do we still try hard? What? would you do? What would you do? I want to delve into the experience of the psalmist, psalm that we read this morning. Because that psalm that we read was probably one that was designed to be sung at home. It talks about the family uh, and the home life. But it also alluded to some choices that needed to be made by the nation of Israel about where to worship. Given the choice, would people choose to worship in the temple or in some new place or even in their own homes and never come to the temple? That was the context, and it is somewhat different from ours, even if we can perhaps draw some parallels to what we've been experiencing in the midst of pandemic, regardless of our own choices in so many of these things. It's been quite disempowering to have some choices made for us. And of course, at a time where the vaccination program's not yet complete, and it might take a wee while yet for some to gain their confidence, you know, there are no fingers getting pointed here at all at all. And I want to be quite plain about that right from the outset. But I have to say, I'm delighted to see so many of you out this morning, uh, upstairs as well as down. It's lovely to see folks uh, being been able to gather here together. It's much, much better than preaching to an empty church. Believe me, you. <laughs> it's lovely to be able to see your faces or at least from the nose up. <laughs> so worship was the context of the psalm. But there are other implications and applications for us today to be found in these words. Because we can't really divorce our worship from the rest of our lives. We can't really set up artificial divisions between that which we say is perhaps secular parts of our life and also our life of faith in God following Christ they're intermingled. And maybe some cultures appreciate that more than our own in this day and age, because certainly for some decades, if not the last couple of centuries, there's been an artificial divide being forced within our own Western culture. But notice with me the psalmist's confidence. Psalm 27, verse 3. Even if a whole army surrounds me, I will not be afraid. Even if enemies attack me, I will still trust in God. And then he goes on to sing, I have asked the Lord for one thing. One thing only do I want, to live in the Lord's house all my life, to marvel there at his goodness, and to ask 
for his guidance. I can't help but be reminded of when we read that particular passage of the kind of assurances that we find in Psalm 23, perhaps a psalm that's far more familiar to us. There's a confidence in the psalms and a confidence in this psalmist, a confidence born of hard-won experience. It's said that you'll find every emotion and every experience within the verses that we find in the Psalms. So I want to take a, a brief opportunity just to invite you not to neglect them. Don't neglect them. If you feel like you're having a hard time or you're looking for advice, the Psalms are a good place to start even before we start asking advice of another soul. They include a whole gamut of human experience. A confidence for life, but also for guidance, that God will guide us. Begging the question whether we might follow that guidance. Do we have that confidence? Some people seem confident in life. They, they seem self-assured. Uh, their approach to life is a can-do attitude. And perhaps that's one of those attitudes that's most exemplified by, by the American people. But, but this kind of confidence surpasses all of that kind. It's a confidence in the one who is greater than all, but who is on our side. That's where we get our confidence. Yet, even in the midst of that confidence, the psalmist continues to hope for guidance. So whilst the, the ultimate end result was a given to him, there were still days in between where he felt he needed assistance to, to make good choices. And, and further, did his assurance for the future mean that he could just free will through life? Is that why God gives us this confidence that he loves us, that he cares for us, that he wants to be there with us? Is that why our parents did the same, hopefully, if we've had good parents who've encouraged us through life? Is that why our parents give us that confidence? Of course not. And nobody likes to be taken for granted, far least parents. We still have to make the best of every single day that we've been given. These kind of things are a two-way street, aren't they? A little bit, perhaps, though, like the Welsh football team tonight. They've virtually got it in the bag, but surely, please, <laughs> surely they're still going to want to play well for the fans, to play well for their own personal satisfaction. I truly hope that they aren't going to take it for granted. We've been given the rules for the game, the only rule for life through Holy Scripture. We learn in the Catechism that the Word of God, which is contained in the Scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we might glorify and enjoy Him, that being God. And surely we've found in our lives that He loves us through Christ, He gives us security through our faith in Christ. He gives us an example by following Christ, and especially in that example of Christ, that we should never take our faith for granted. That security should never be taken for granted. Whether it's our, our work life or our home life, our, our worship or, or other ways that we express our spirituality, surely but surely we want to give it our best. We want to see it improve rather than decline. We want to see God honored. And we want to see blessings in our lives, don't we? We want to see our church grow in strength. We want to see our church family grow in spirit. In the immediate future, we also yearn for restrictions to finally be fully relaxed so we can enjoy our full fellowship, a cup of coffee, a chance to chat with one another openly, a chance to sing. And I'm sure we want to do our part in bringing all of that together, even now, 
helping the kingdom of God to grow. But it takes time. It takes time. We're getting there. And in the meantime, what steps are we personally taking to make all of that a reality? Are we seeking God's advice? Or leaning on our own ideas? Do we see ourselves as pilgrims in life, needing God's guidance through all the different challenges that we face? This Father's Day, are we looking to our Heavenly Father? Are we seeking His face in prayer for all of our concerns in life? And are we laying hold of a greater confidence that has less to do with, with health in this life and absolutely nothing to do with football, can I say? but far more to do with the confidence that we acquire through faith in Jesus Christ, our Messiah and King. The kind of confidence that was experienced by the psalmist. Confidence in our God for this life and for the next. I have asked the Lord for one thing. One thing only do I want. To live in the Lord's house all my life to marvel there at his goodness and to ask for his guidance. May that be our prayer as we draw confidence in this life and for the next from the Lord our God. Amen. We conclude our worship this morning with him 535 who would true valor see? we walk confidently into this week. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide upon you all and those whom you love, both now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>